Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we are studying in Leviticus chapter 7. Cleanse from guilt by the blood of the sacrifice, by the blood of Jesus. In this chapter, Moses receives laws concerning the preparation of the trespass or guilt offering. Uh, it may seem somewhat redundant. These protocols are repeated through the book of Leviticus, but each offering was very personal, and each offering involved, with very few exceptions, the shedding of blood. Why the shedding of blood? Because all of our works, all of our efforts at compensating for our sin do not move God's hand. But the blood of Jesus moves the mountains of guilt, moves the mountains of condemnation lodged against us because of transgression. Leviticus 7 also reveals to us why Jesus was raised on the third day, not the second day or the fourth day. And we'll touch on that. Uh, it's connected with his priestly ministry. He's, he's our high priest, touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And it gives us a sense what we read here, what the priests do with the blood here. Jesus did with his blood when he ascended and went into the temple that's in the heavens. So this is Leviticus 7, 38 verses, and we're going to read the entire chapter. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. Some things were holy, some things were most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the trespass offering, and the blood thereof shall be sprinkled round about the altar. And he shall offer it all, the fat thereof, the rump, and the fat that covers the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the caul that is above the liver, and the kidneys shall he take away. And the, the priest shall burn them upon the altar for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a trespass offering. Every male among the priests shall eat thereof. So they not only made the offerings, but they were to eat a portion of the offerings in the holy place, for it is most holy. So it's most holy, but they ate it in a holy place. Those are not just um, random adjectives. Those are very specific uh, instructions. As the sin offering is, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest that makes atonement therewith shall have it, have his portion. And the priest that offers any man's burnt offering, even that priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he hath offered, and all the meat offering that is baked in the oven and all the that is dressed in the frying pan and in the pan it shall be the priest that offers it. Now in that case meat is not meat like we think of it's meal. Uh, and every meat offering mingled with oil or meal offering mingled with oil and dry shall all the sons of Aaron have one as much as another. And this is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offerings which he shall offer unto his Lord. And if he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and leavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. Now it's important to point out that the sin offering did not involve cakes mingled with oil. They were not to put oil on the sin offering, because God does not anoint sin. Besides the cakes, he shall, verse 13, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And of it shall he offer one out of the whole oblation for a heave offering unto the Lord, and it shall be the priest that sprinkles the blood of the peace offering. So again, mention of the priest's portion. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered, and the, he, the priest, shall not leave any of it until morning. Uh, but if, so all of these offerings, the people would bring their offerings of animal sacrifice or 
cakes mingled with oil or not mingled with oil. And a big part of it was not only offering it on the burnt, uh, altar of burnt offering, but eating it as well. You wonder whether these guys had to join Weight Watchers because everything they did pretty much involved eating their portion of the offering. Verse 16. But if the offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten in the same day. So some things they could eat the next day, other things had to be eaten in the same day. The same day that he offers the sacrifice, and on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall he burn with fire. Now notice the third day. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day, that will not be accepted. In other words, if the priest mishandled the offering, the offering was not received by God, even though the person bringing the offering didn't make the transgression. Uh, Neither shall it be imputed unto him that offered it. It shall be an abomination, and the soul that eat of, of it shall bear his iniquity. So if they didn't eat it when they were supposed to, it, the offering was nullified. Verse 19. And the flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. And as for the flesh, all that is clean, you shall eat thereof. But the soul that eats of the flesh and the sacrifice of the peace offerings that pertains to the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. What is it saying? That if a priest was ceremonially unclean, like if he had touched a dead body or something of this nature, and offering the offering, the offering became an abomination. It speaks to the fact that Jesus, as our high priest, was sinless, and the priest had to portray that by being ceremonially clean. And if they were unclean, the sacrifice was rendered null, was, was nullified. Moreover, the soul that touches any unclean thing as the uncleanness of man or an, any unclean beast or any abominable thing and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, which pertains to the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. So what he's saying there is the priests and their families were allowed to partake of the priest portions of the offerings, but if they were unclean, that was a very grave thing for them to eat of it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, You shall eat no manner of fat of ox, of sheep, or of goat. And the fat of the beast that dieth of itself, and the fat that is torn with beasts, may be used in any other use, but you will not in any wise eat of it. For whatsoever eateth the fat of the beast, of which man men offer, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, even the soul that eateth it shall be cut off from among his people. So a prohibition against partaking of the fat of an animal. Uh, with specific attention, if you were listening to the fat surrounding the internal organs. Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be fowl or beast in any of your dwellings, whatsoever soul it be that eats any manner of blood, even that soul will be cut off from his people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, He that offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his oblation unto the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands will bring the offerings, the Lord, to be made by fire, fat with the breast, it shall he bring, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. So in other words, if you wanted to make a sacrifice, you couldn't send your servant to make the sacrifice and uh, give some thought to people that say, well, you can't go on the mission field, but if you give us your money, it's the same thing. This in pattern and foreshadowing of the Old Testament of the New speaks uh, references contrary to that. Uh, <laughs> speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, he's on hands. Verse 31. And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And the right shoulder shall you give unto the priest for a heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And he among the sons of Aaron that offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right shoulder 
for his part. For the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel for from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings, and I have given them unto Aaron and the priest uh, and unto his sons by a statute forever among the children of Israel. This is a portion of the anointing. This is the portion of the anointing of Aaron and the anointing of his sons out of the offerings of the Lord made by fire in the day when he presented them to minister unto the Lord in the priest's office, which the Lord commanded to be given them of the children of Israel in the day that he anointed them by a statute forever unto their generations. This is the law of the burnt offering and of the sin offering and of the trespass offerings and of the consecrations and of the sacrifice of the peace offerings. So we see these different offerings, the burnt offering, the meal or meat offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the consecrations and the peace offerings. Uh, verse 38, which the Lord commanded Moses in Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their oblations unto the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Why do we study this? We have people just make the remark that the book that's the most difficult for them after the book of Job is Leviticus. But if you immerse yourself into this, you always have to remember when you see shedding of blood, priesthood, and sacrifice, it's talking about who Jesus is to us in the new covenant. So in verse 1, we find reference to the law of sin or the trespass offering. The trespass offering in the Hebrew language is parsed as the guilt offering. When we think of guilt, we think of it as something to get away from, to deal with as quickly as possible. <coughs> Pardon me, the guilt offering is defined separate from other categories of offering by sacrifice, by the declaration that the guilt offering is most holy. Some things were considered holy, other things were considered most holy. What's the difference? If you read Exodus 26, 33, you'll find the very first mention of something being most holy. And what that is, it was referring to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So ever after that in Scripture where something is mentioned as most holy, you think of it as being connected with the glory of God above the mercy seat where the sin, the national sin of the people was cleansed once a year by the high priest. In verse 2, Moses is instructed on the dispensing or handling of blood after the sacrifice was exsanguinated, the blood out. Uh, the blood was to be sprinkled by the priest, not on the altar, but around the altar, where the altar where the body of the sacrificial beast was burned. So we see there's a connection between blood and guilt in the eyes of God. Uh, Men deal with guilt by excuses and accusations. God deals with guilt by the blood. Psychologists try to deal with guilt by many means, including blame shifting, talking you out of your guilt, um, suggesting that your sins, the things that make you feel guilty, are not your fault, but a product of your environment, or it's nothing to feel guilty about because that's how God made you, so to speak. Uh, consider this cynical definition of guilt found in the medical dictionaries that train our doctors. Guilt, feelings of culpability, especially for imagined offenses. So they're coming from a position God does not exist. There's no one to offend. Or from a sense of inadequacy. Morbid self-reproach. Oh, it's morbid. Don't, don't be that way. You're practically perfect in every way often manifest in the marked preoccupation with the moral correctness. Oh, don't be preoccupied with morality. If it feels good, do it. You see how far afield man's way of thinking is from the law of God? God intends that 
we not be bound by guilt to endlessly carry guilt or shame around in our lives, but to be pronounced free, not by excuses or blame shifting, but by the efficacy of the shed blood of Christ. Paul makes, or who understood all of these laws, makes the following statements, uh, Ephesians 2.13. Now you are in Christ. You who were sometimes afar off are made nigh, not by your moral quality, but made nigh, Paul says, by the blood of Christ. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall your moral quality, blame shifting or excuses, no. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So the blood deals with guilt. In First John chapter 1, 7, John the beloved wrote, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood, not blame shifting, not narcissism, not I'm okay, you're okay, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So we can't cleanse ourselves. We can't deal with it by being good people, moral people. See, God never intended religious culture, Christian culture, to use guilt, but to expiate, to get rid of guilt. Not through blame shifting, but through repentance, contrition, and faith in Calvary's shed blood. In verse 4, we find instructions relating to the special handling of the kidneys and the liver of the sacrifice. Uh, the kidneys and the liver were to be taken and burned upon the altar uh, in a specific way, in other words, separate from the other parts of the sacrifice. The kidneys and the liver represented the emotions to ancient peoples. The Babylonians used the liver in rites of divination. The, the liver and the kidneys to ancient peoples were regarded in much the same way we regard the heart as the seat of emotions, the home of the spirit, the organ of life. In offering the kidneys and the liver, we are offering ourselves. This is what is meant to give our lives. Uh, we would say give our hearts to God. Ancient people would have just as comfortably said give their livers to God because they understand that to be the seat of who they were. Remember that the one offering would always put his hand on the head of the offering in giving it to the priest. What that means is the sacrifice not only represents Jesus as the Lamb of God, but it represents us giving ourselves to God. We are giving ourselves to God. God is giving himself to us. That's why Paul makes the statement in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Every Hebrew who had ever made a sacrifice understood exactly what that meant and made the connection to the sacrificial protocols of priesthood in the temple. After the sacrificial animal was properly presented to God, Verse 6 instructs that it would be eaten in the holy place, the priest's portion. Unlike other offerings that were to be wholly burned, uh, the trespass or guilt offering would be eaten by the officiating priest. It was considered most holy, but it was eaten in a holy place set aside for that purpose. When the priest would eat the, the sin offering, the picture of Jesus couldn't be more precise. Jesus took our sin upon himself in the holy place, becoming sin as an act of obedience rather than rebellion. <coughs> Pardon me. Paul says this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he that made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us. The language of this verse could not be clearer, but at the same time, is very controversial, depending on how you interpret it. Jesus became sin, period. He identified himself more than by mere imputation with our sinfulness. He wasn't saying, uh, I didn't do any of that, but I'm going to take your whipping. Somehow, in ways that are difficult to uh, fathom, 
He became sin with our sinfulness that we might be identified with his righteousness. It wasn't just some mere reckoning or some cosmic pretense on Father God's part. Verse 17, look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He became sin so that we could become what this verse talks about. Any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Not wink, wink, not really, but I'll call you that. No, he's a new creature. Old things, the sin things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 21, for he made Jesus, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. We are in reality the righteousness of God, not just in reckoning. If you understand, it wasn't just like a euphemism and not really, but I uh, will give you a break. The language in this verse that describes Jesus being made sin implies actual transformation. Thus, because that being made sin makes us the righteousness of God, we understand that it is not just imputation or transformation by which we become in Christ, one version of the Bible says, a new species altogether, a new creation. Salvation is not merely imputed or mentally reckoned to us. We actually change, as 1 Peter 1.23 says, that we are born again by the incorruptible seed, even the word of God. In verse 7, this whole process is brought under the heading of the atonement or the at one We are atoned for in the shed blood of Jesus. We can't atone for ourselves. The result was that the giver was atoned for or brought into right relationship with God by the spilling of blood. And they did that year by year with animal blood, demonstrating what ultimately would become the one sacrifice that doesn't have to be repeated of Jesus on the cross. That word atone in Hebrew is the word kapar, K-A-P-A-R. It means that we are covered. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We need to pause and think about that. Jesus made a statement in Matthew 23 verse 9, he said, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. What does that mean? He's our covering. I submit to you that only the blood of Christ can cover. Every other cover is a religious misconception at best and manipulation at worst. When we look at Abraham and Lot's relationship, we see that Abraham was not fully secure in his destiny until he sent Lot away. Lot's name means covering. Only the blood can cover you. A pastor can't cover you. The only exe the exception to that is in regard to what Paul teaches in Corinthians about a husband covering his wife. Some of us are laboring under the false idea that the pastor or some other leader is your covering. And you're robbing yourself of full engagement in the purposes of God by virtue, not of the covering of man, but the covering of Christ. If you're being covered by a man or, or a woman in leadership, you're being covered by sin because they're inherently sinful. Man cannot cover you. Sinful man cannot cover you. Only the blood of Christ can cover you. In verse 11, the law of the peace offering is defined. And instruction is given concerning it. The peace offering foreshadows Jesus as the Prince of Peace, who is our peace between God and us. That Hebrew word there for peace is the Salom or the Shalom offering, or what they call the requital offering. It was seen as a friendship or an alliance offering. When you brought that, you're saying, I'm a friend of God and God is my friend. As the sin offering was connected with the Ark of the Covenant by being called most holy, the peace offering was connected with God's relationship with Abraham. Let's read James chapter 2, verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for what? for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. A Hebrew person reading that would make connections with the peace offering. The Israelites understood Abraham to be the blood covenant partner of God. As Abraham's seed, that blood covenant was passed on to them. When a generational 
covenant was observed, it was of necessity to be renewed. In the minds of the ancient Semites, they had to bring that covenant into remembrance once in a while by the shedding of blood. That was the purpose of the peace offering, to remind God, not that he forgets, but he tells us to remind him, and to remind the worshiper that a covenant of blood existed between God and Abraham's descendants and was conferred upon them and includes us. <coughs> Pardon me. The book of Galatians is devoted to emphasizing the fact that you and I are likewise inheritors of Abraham's blessings. In verse 12, we see that the peace offering was to be accomplished or accompanied by cakes, unleavened cakes soaked in oil. The unleavened cakes mingled with oil are a picture of Christ, who is our peace. That word Christ means smeared one. Jesus said he was the bread of life. He's saturated with oil, just like the sacrifices we're reading about here. The cakes in the peace offering would be anointed or soaked or smeared with oil, which foreshadows Jesus as the bread of life, the anointed one, soaked or smeared with oil as the embodiment of our peace through the work of redemption on the cross. In verse 15, it relates to the peace offering. We see that the priest's portion had to be eaten on the same day that it was offered. That requirement did not apply to other offerings, which could be eaten the same day or on another day, uh, in a holy place, but not necessarily the same day it was offered. The peace offering had to be eaten the same day it was offered. That speaks to us about God's timing. The concept of the day of the Lord. Now, today, the same day is the day of salvation. It's about God's set season. We set our season in God by partaking of same day blessing. Now, what is the nature of the peace offering? What is the nature of the peace of God in the believer's life? Romans 5.1 says we are justified by faith. Thereby we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does peace come? by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by any efforts on our part. We say, make your peace with God. You can't make peace with God. Jesus is your peace. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. The peace with ha we have with God is not a human thing. You can't make peace with God. When we think of peace, we think of mutual combatants, people fighting, refraining from fighting each other or leaving each other alone. God's peace, the peace we have with Christ, is not just that way. It implies covenantal engagement that involves God in every area of your life and involves you in service to God in the initiatives of the kingdom. In verse 17, there's mention of the part of the sacrifice that remained uh, on the third day. Here is the prophetic theme of the third day that crops up throughout Scripture. Some offerings were eaten on the same, same day. Some could be eaten on any consecutive day. Some specifically had to be eaten on the third day. That phrase, third day, appears 38 times in the scriptures and many times in connection with resurrection, miracles, and creation. Jesus was raised the third day, and that was the day he presented himself in the heavens and sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat. Hebrews 4.14 gives us a picture of that, that we have a high priest passed into the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, therefore let us hold fast our profession. So Jesus passed in the heavens and sprinkled his blood on the things, the tabernacle and the altar in the heavens. So why the third day and not the fourth day? Because as our high priest, he had to appear before the Father as our high priest on the third day in fulfillment of the dictates of the law we're reading about here regarding the peace offering, that he might stand in the tabernacle or temple of heaven to ratify the new covenant before, uh, before the Father. Now, there are 1,000-year days in God's timetable as well, and we are currently in the third 1,000-year day from the resurrection and the seventh 1,000-year day from creation. In verse 21, there are strict warnings to the priests about handling the peace offering and that the person had to be ceremonially clean on penalty of death. The idea of touching an unclean thing and being cut off for doing it points to the fact that we can't cleanse ourselves. We cannot rectify sin by our efforts to God's satisfaction. We must look to the shed blood of Christ to establish as the only way to establish our acceptance before God and our station in the economy of the kingdom. In verses 25 through 27, we see a prohibition regarding the consumption of fat or blood. 
The people are forbidden to eat fat. They're forbidden to eat blood. And another verse in Leviticus says that the life is in the blood. And God's life is in the blood of Jesus. Blood, therefore, is sacred. Fat is a picture of surplus. Our surplus belongs to God which he usually directs to be given to the poor. In uh, verses 29 and 30, we see that those making the offerings had to bring with the offerings with their own hands, as I mentioned earlier. In other words, you couldn't send a substitute. You couldn't send an employee or a servant to make the offering. The atonement, the peace offering, was invalid unless it was the very person offering it up, bringing it, and no one else. The people were not allowed to telegraph their offerings in to the Lord. Their own hands had to present them to God. Inherent in religion is the idea of proxy service, but that doesn't exist in the scriptures. We expect the pastor to pray for us, the missionary to go for us, the teacher to study for us, and we rely falsely on the piety of others in our lives who are close to God when it's not convenient for us to do so ourselves. God uh, is putting us in this day and age, on our own recognizance, you cannot leave to others the role of spiritual leadership or engagement. You have to shoulder those responsibilities, as these passages uh, point out. In verse 32, we see that the right shoulder was the specific part of the sacrifice that was apportioned to the priest to have for himself. The right side of something speaks of kingship and entitlement. The shoulder speaks to us in scripture of the government of God. Isaiah talks about this in Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And any Hebrew reading that would instantly make the connection with the right heave shoulder that belonged to the priest. So it let them know that the Messiah would not just be a king, he would also be a priest. The mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. The right shoulder is also symbolic of our service. Our lives are not our own. We belong to God, and every believer has a ministry portion by which we are called to serve him. These are the commandments of God handed down to Moses while he was on Sinai with the children of Israel waiting below to implement everything that Jehovah instructed. Leviticus it may seem uh, somewhat redundant, but it's just a layered emphasis on who Jesus is what he's done for us, the fact that we cannot expiate or deal with transgression by being good people or moral people or nice people, but only the blood of Jesus expiates our sin. God bless you.